Well, hello and a very good evening to you. I'm John Nicholson. I'm a trustee of the Spitalfields Trust and welcome uh, to tonight's talk. I was going to say it's going to be a uh, great fun, but I'm not sure that's really the right way to introduce a, a talk described as a catalogue of planning disasters. Um, I noticed that the gentle author has called this uh, a comedy, a, co a comic uh, talk, but if it's a comedy, it surely is a comedy of errors. As somebody who's owned a house and restored a derelict house in Spitalfields more than 25 years ago now, I've watched some of the most extraordinary, disastrous planning mistakes take place that I think are only really matched in my home city of, uh, of Glasgow. So there's an unfortunate combination given that I've spent my time in, um, in both of these wonderful places. Uh, they're both beautiful urban environments too. So, uh, uh, and places that you can easily feel incredibly attached to. Spitalfields is a simply fascinating and beautiful place. We're going to hear a lot about it uh, tonight. Our talk is going to be for up to an hour. I'm not quite sure it's going to be as long as an hour. And we're going to be guided through those disasters by tonight's speaker, Alex Forshaw. Now, Alex has the most wonderful CV. I'm just looking at it here. He worked as a town planning of uh, town planning, urban design and conservation with the London Borough of Islington. Just before we came on air, he was telling me some um, absolutely wonderful stories of uh, enforcement actions that he was involved in taking the most awful developers, uh, builders and surveyors to court, getting them criminal convictions and importantly, forcing them to reinstate um, horrible things that they'd done to beautiful listed buildings um, and discouraging others from doing the same. Alas, that has rarely, if ever happened in Tower Hamlets. Um, Alex uh, lectures, campaigns and acts as a trustee for many heritage organisations, including some of my favourite, the Victorian Society, the 20th Century Society, the Heritage of London Trust, the Church's Conservation Trust, Save Britain's Heritage and the Islington Building Preservation Trust. And as so often my cat Rocco here makes a guest uh, uh, appearance, he's the most uh, shocking fo uh, photo and video bomber, really. Um, I'm very much looking forward to Alex's talk this evening. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Alex Forshaw, who will take us through the rest of this evening's talk. Thank you for joining us. Well, very good evening, everybody. And um, <clears throat> yes, I'll try and keep this uh, talk uh, sort of light-hearted, at least. Um, but and perhaps there is an element of black humour uh, to to it all, and a fine line between tragedy and comedy. Um, but uh, I don't think I'm going to have you rolling in the aisles. Um, not, of course, that you probably can roll in an aisle if you're sitting at home, unless you live in a church conversion. Um, anyway, I digress. Um, Spitalfields. Uh, this map um, sort of shows the area. Um, it doesn't have precise boundaries, really, Spitalfields. Um, uh, but uh, on the, I'm going to use a cursor here, which I hope you can see. Um, on, it's really bounded on its western side by the old Roman road um, running north of Bishopsgate, Norton Folgate, Shoreditch. And then its northern boundary is perhaps Bethnal Green Road. Um, although the residents of Arnold Circus may feel they're in Spitalfields rather than Shoreditch. Um, uh, and then uh, to the south, we have Whitechapel um, and Allgate. Um, and then to the east, the boundary really with, with Whitechapel is, is quite diffuse, um, I think. Um, uh, it's one of the most uh, fantastic parts of London. I, I really wanted to start, um, if I can find the cursor. Um, Where's it gone to take me to the next slide? Uh, there we are. Yeah, this is a step back in time to the mid 1980s, just to remind you what Spitalfields used to be like. Um, it had one of London's great wholesale markets, fruit and vegetable market established here in the 19th century, um, but owned and run by the city 
corporation um, from 1902 onwards. And this brought uh, a great sense of um, vitality, vibrancy to the area. Um, here we are um, in uh, full swing, Brushfield Street. Let me see the cursor here. We need some help on the, finding the cursor, sorry. Uh, sorry, technical problems. Um, I have an assistant here, so <laughs> my eyes are very bad, so I can't see anything. Right, so lots of potatoes. Um, but as well as um, as as well as uh, the, the the vegetable market, there was of course an air of uh, fantastic. Uh, old houses. Um, no idea. I just can't see what I'm doing. I think I'm going to have to ask you to the next slide. So next slide. Um, wonderful uh, early 18th century houses. Um, in the 80s, still a lot of them very run down um, in mixture of uses, commercial uses. You can, you can see here the, the state. Next slide. Um, the uh, latest wave of immigrants, the Bengali community, were well established by this time, um, so following in a, wa a wave of different immigrants, of Huguenots, Irish, Jewish, and then the Bengalis. Um, next slide. Uh, some of the houses were being done up. Um, uh, this is Elder Street, um, refurbished and underway, but still a lot to be done. Next slide. And then in the north of the area, um, uh, a wonderful retail market, uh, Brick Lane, Sunday Market, Brick Lane and Club Row, the uh, animal market that was suppressed in the 1980s. Um, uh, but uh, an incredible scene which drew all sorts of people to it um, every Sunday. Uh, a lot of the produce was second hand as well. Next slide. Looking down Cheshire Street. Next slide. And all sorts of extraordinary characters were drawn to this market. Next slide, um, the busker of Brick Lane, a famous photograph. Next slide. But in the south of um, Spitalfields, there was another wonderful market, um, the Petticoat Lane Sunday Market in, in Middlesex Street, and its offshoot um, in Wentworth Street, um, which also operated on weekday lunch times. Again, very important to the local community and with its own local characters. Next slide. Uh, this is Tubby Isaacs, who had a sort of Welks Jelly Deal store. Um, next slide. I'm going to talk about six sites with the red blobs here. Next slide. And they are Spitalfields Market, Fruit and Wool Exchange, Norton Folgate, Bishopsgate Good Yard, Whitechapel High Street, and finally the Old Truman Brewery, um, which is the subject of a current planning application. Next slide. So here we are um, uh, in order. And uh, next slide, starting with Spitalfields Market. Well, uh, there had been a proposal um, uh, back in the 1970s pushed by the Greater London Council to move all London's wholesale markets out of the centre of London to suburban sites. Um, and three of those markets um, were owned by the City Corporation. That was Billingsgate, which moved to Docklands in 1982, Smithfield Market, which there was a great battle to keep it um, where it was um, in the 1980s, um, and Spitalfields Market, which was moved. A decision was taken to move it in 1987. Uh, next slide. Um, there's the city corporation's arms. Um, I say they were the owners, owners of the land, owners of the market, um, owners of its charter. Next slide. And it was moved to a new site in Stratford. Um, and here it is, um, opened in 1991. Uh, a much larger site um, sprawling over um, what had been Temple Mills. Next slide. Uh, incidentally, well, coincidentally really, um, the site of it is uh, on the front cover of this book which um, has just been published. Um, uh, this is a picture taken in 1983 of the site where Spitalville's market moved to 
then clearly a derelict site. Next slide. Well, what to be done with the site? Um, the, the city corporation pretty much owned all the land between um, Commercial Street and Norton Folgate. Um, and uh, next slide. Um, it's worth remembering that the, um, the boundaries between Tower Hamlets and the City of London were different um, in the 1980s. What this um, plan shows in blue are the existing borough boundaries. Um, and in red, the boundaries that existed up until 1994. Next slide. So uh, focusing on um, the um, uh, Spitalfields area, you can see that uh, a sizable chunk of the Spitalfields area, of the market area, east of Bishopsgate was uh, during the 1980s within the city corporation. So they were the planning authority, as well as being the owner of the land. Always something of a fatal combination. Next slide. Um, the 1980s was the time also of the Big Bang, uh, the deregulation of the money markets. And um, the city corporation were desperate to find new sites um, where new office accommodation could be built to provide principally dealing floors for the international banks that were flooding into market, into international banks that were flooding into London to enjoy the deregulated markets. This um, is a, a shot uh, of uh, the Broadgate site. You're looking at the north end of uh, the old Liverpool Street station before it was extended. Um, with the NatWest Tower in the background. And the first phase of, of Bishopsgate with the cranes on the right is underway. Um, and the city saw the Spitalfields market area as an area to extend the city. Um, that was uh, clearly their main driving agenda. And they set about, the next slide, uh, giving themselves um, a planning permission to develop the east side of the Bishopsgate um, and uh, two big buildings were put up. Um, this is new headquarters of the Royal Bank of Scotland, uh, completed in uh, 2001. Next slide. And then just further north, same year, um, numbers 280 and 288, Bishopsgate, built by Foggo Architects. Big um, slabs of glass and steel um, uh, with big floor plates. Um, these aren't skyscrapers, they're, they're more in the form of, of ground scrapers with, with big floor plates. Next slide. Um, at the back of these, to the east of them, a new public square was created, Bishop Square. Um, here it is a few years ago, and next slide shows it more recently with the trees grown up. Um, indeed, a, a welcome new addition to the public realm. Um, but uh, east of that, uh, permission was eventually given after a, a big planning battle really with, with lots of local interest groups who, who, who wanted uh, a non-office future for the area. Permission was eventually given um, for an even bigger office slab designed by uh, Norman Foster. And planning permission for that was eventually given in 2002 and it was completed in 2008. Next slide. And here we see what it is, up to 14 storeys. So it's, again, it's not a tower, but it's a big floor plate. Um, and into this building went one of the big uh, city law firms, Allen and Overy. Um, in the meantime, um, while uh, all this argument was going on, um, uh, some of the old market buildings, particularly those fronting onto a commercial street, um, had been taken over by the entrepreneur, Eric Reynolds. Um, who made his name really doing Camden Lock market in the, in the 70s and then Greenwich Market and Gabriel's Wharf, um, a real market man. Um, and uh, he, he was largely responsible for, for, for bringing um, as the, um, the best of the market buildings uh, back to life. Next slide. Um, uh, but the impact of the Foster building on the on the area is really quite immense. Next slide. Um, here we can see sort of looming looming over Brushville Street. Next slide, and looking down towards Christchurch, you can see the bulk 
of the of the Foster Building looming over the area. Next slide. Um, uh, the, the market buildings um, have been much um, sort of tarted up now. Um, Eric Reynolds is no longer around. It's become much more corporate, um, um, much more expensive rents. Um, next slide. Um, uh, but there's still the feeling it's very difficult to get away from the, the sense of the, the office buildings looming over you. So uh, that first... Um, a decision really to, to, to let the city move east of Bishopsgate um, has really sort of set the trend for what all these subsequent battles are about um, and it's worth bearing that in mind. Next slide. So the next um, site on the uh, agenda is the Fruit and Wool Exchange which occupies a large chunk of the south side of um, Brushfield Street. Um, this institution was moved out of the city itself uh, in the 1920s um, when this quite fine building was put up in 1929 it was finished and uh, um, some art deco details. Um, uh, next slide, some quite fine internal spaces. Um, this is the sort of trading, trading floor. Quite a curious combination really, fruit and wool, but um, there we are. Um, that's sort of one of the one, one of the commodity markets. Next slide. Other nice details like uh, the, the, the central staircase. Well, about 20 years ago now, the, um, the, that exchange market um, uh, was winding down and the city were corporation, can own the site, were looking to redevelop the site for corporate offices. Next slide. The site actually, uh, also included um, uh, the White's Row multi-storey car park, which you can see on the bottom here, also owned by the City Corporation. And these two sites were separated by Duval Street. I'm sorry, it's a slightly fuzzy image. Um, Duval Street, formerly known as Dorset Street. Um, uh, next slide. Um, this is a, a picture taken from uh, the outside Christchurch, and on the left-hand side, you're looking down Duval Street, you're looking at the south elevation of the Wool Exchange. Next slide. And this is a, an image looking the other way, back towards the churchyard with the multi-storey car park. Um, not a thing of great beauty, put up in the 60s, I think, um, four levels of multi-storey car parking on the right-hand side. Next slide. Um, Dorset Street, as it was, was is a street of immense historic interest. Those of you who've read Dan Crookshank's book on Spitalfields will, will have read about this. This is a, a photograph, famous photograph taken uh, in about 1900. It was, it, it was a street of great notoriety, um, uh, immense poverty. Um, but um, there was a great concern that this street was going to be swept away in the plans that the city corporation were bringing forward. Next slide. Indeed, this shows a ground floor um, plan of what was being proposed, which was the demise of um, um, the demise of Dorset Street or Duval Street. This is White's Row at the bottom here. This is Brushfield Street at the top. So what they were proposing on the ground floor was uh, a mix of entrances to commercial offices above and then some retail units. Uh, next. Right. Um, an alternative scheme was produced, um, commissioned by the Sp Spitalfields Trust, um, who, who wanted Duval Street to be kept and they also wanted some housing on the site, um, not just a monolithic um, commercial development. Um, and here we see an enlargement of that scheme. But um, uh, the Tower Hamlet's offices, um, planning offices, were seem to be perfectly happy with the uh, City Corporation's proposals. Um, went to uh, planning committee um, and planning committee refused the scheme. Um, and of course, what happened was the, the City Corpor Corporation um, went to their friend um, the, the then Mayor of London, who uh, overturned the refusal and granted planning permission um, to the developer. Uh, and the scheme 
was built, um, it involved a degree of facadism, no more than that. Um, the guts of the building were ripped out. Um, here we can see the Duval Street elevation um, being torn apart. And this is what we've ended up with, a, a true ground scraper. Um, uh, and um, it is pretty much um, uh, what you get with a sort of overblown development. This is the impact you get from commercial streets. So additional store is put on the top, um, which uh, give it, I think, too much presence in the street. And of uh, course, from the central atrium, what you see is a completely typical glass and steel box with big floor plate offices. Could be anywhere. On the ground floor, uh, the uh, shop till you drop. Well, there aren't none of the shops have been taken. Uh, they're all empty. Um, it's a pretty ghostly and desperate place. Um, soulless, I would say. Um, let's go back if we can. Um, to so I'm skipping over too many slides. Let's just skip back. So the next slide, um, uh, with the next scheme, Norton Folgate. Um, which is a roughly triangular area north of um, the Spitalfields Market um, bordered really by Folgate Street, Commercial Street um, and Norton Folgate Shoreditch High Street on the east hand side. Um, this is an aerial view of it, um, um, largely covered in um, historic buildings all within the Elder Street conservation area. Um, a couple of empty sites either side of Fleur de Lis Street, um, occupied by car parking. All this land was owned by the City Corporation. Um, the City Corporation are immense owners of land. Um, while the City of London is comparatively small, the square mile, its land ownership um, across London and indeed outside London is absolutely immense, um, hence its wealth. Um, Proposals came um, forward um, in 2014 to redevelop comprehensively this site um, to the great alarm of the Spitalfields Trust. Just to remind you um, historically what Norton Folgate, Bishopsgate, used to look like, um, this photograph taken about 100 and, uh, 120 years ago, looking south towards the city. Um, uh, and here's a photograph taken um, or about five years ago um, with the buildings um, on the left hand side threatened with demolition. On the right hand side we've got um, the Broadgate development um, and in the background on the left we've got Foggo, uh, Foggo's buildings um, on Bishopsgate itself. And just further north uh, from where that photograph was taken, um, this very charming uh, 1920s building, which had been the, the headquarters and showrooms of Nichols and Clark, um, who were um, a wholesaler in, in, in hardware and ironmongery, occupied the site for a very long time. Um, a fine building, um, very nice details during the clock um, and uh, nice details here. Um, and in, in good condition, um, perfectly capable of reuse, as was exemplified by a temporary exhibition, the Best of, Best of British exhibition, which was held here. And you can see just what the accommodation was, um, really good reusable space. At the back was Blossom Street, um, one of the finest streets of uh, late 19th century warehouses in London. This is looking south towards Folgate Street. This is looking north up towards Shoreditch. And you can see this fantastic run, run of buildings. And again, inside, um, wonderful robust materials, cast iron columns, fantastic timbers. Um, uh, I got involved with uh, trying to fight this scheme. Um, uh, uh, another, another of the buildings at risk was the, uh, the much loved water poet um, pub on the corner of Blossom Street and Folgate Street. 
um, a rambling, shambling sort of place, but with, with, with fine outside spaces here, a bit of greenery, a um, bit of fresh air, a lovely single story gallery, always with art on the walls, um, a much cherished local place, also threatened. And uh, the site really, it, it had great resonance to me with the, with the, with the teachings of, of Jane Jacobs, who, who sort of famously said that cities need old buildings so badly for them to survive. And the argument here is not really a heritage one, but an economic one in that old buildings provide affordable space because they have been paid for many times over. Um, when you build a new building, you've got to pay back the construction costs and so rents inevitably tend to be high. Um, here are the proposals, um, which uh, was largely to flatten the site, keeping a few facades and just a couple of buildings. Um, we were appalled by this, the Spittle Hills Trust. We produced, here we are, this is what was being proposed in new buildings in white um, and a much higher scale than anything already on the site. Um, an alternative was, scheme was produced by um, John Burrell of Burrell Foley Fisher Architects. Um, pink buildings are the existing ones kept, blue buildings, um, new ones stitched into the empty sites. This is another view of it looking from the northwest um, with Norton Fulgate um, in the foreground. Um, again, we were faced with planning officers who were in favour of the developer, it was British land, uh, British land scheme for comprehensive redevelopment. Um, this shows the elevations of a John Burrell scheme, um, some modest uh, extensions to the roofs of the warehouses set back discreetly. And the great thing here was there was going to be a mixture of use, retail, showroom, studios, workshops, residential, a mixture of affordable and less affordable residential. Um, there was an outcry about the scheme. Um, a human chain was, was um, uh, encouraged and formed as a level of protest. Um, and th these protests were successful um, in persuading um, Tower Hamlet's council to overturn the officer's recommendation for approval. They refused the scheme on three grounds, harm to the conservation area, not enough housing and not enough affordable housing. Yet again, the corporation and British land went to their friend, um, uh, Mayor Johnson, who inevitably, I think, um, gave planning permission. Um, his consideration seemed to be cursory at best. Permission was given, uh, great apprehension, apprehension when hoardings went up, and I think our apprehension fully justified. Here we see the site um, following demolition. Um, a few bits of facade propped up. Um, this is where the Water Poet pub was with its gardens and yards. Um, very sad. And this is looking across uh, towards Shoreditch High Street and the monsters on the west side principal place. And here we've got the facade propped up on Commercial Street, again with principal place in the background. And this is Norton Folgate, um, where the Nichols and Clark building used to be. It's a very sad tale, I think. Um, made even sadder, I think, um, 2019, um, the small amount of housing that had been included in the scheme that was approved by Mayor Johnson, um, even that was given away by the Tower Hamlets planners when British land uh, applied to replace that housing with more offices. So it is now a 100% commercial scheme, no housing at all. No wonder, perhaps, that there's a housing shortage in Tower Hamlets. Uh, and this is what it's going to look like. And this is what it'll seem like from, from Tower Hamlets. Um, a very far cry from what was there before. Um, 
the little gap between these two buildings is Fleur de Lis passage. That's what it, what, what it used to be like. I doubt whether it's going to feel like that ever again. So onto the fourth scheme in this, this happy catalogue. Um, the Bishopsgate Goods Yard, a large site which actually straddles the two boroughs of Hackney and Tower uh, Hamlets. Um, and where arguably perhaps uh, given the size of the site and the fact that it does straddle two boroughs, um, the mayor or the GLA might indeed have an interest as it is a site of perhaps a London wide importance. Something that can't I think be said of the Wool Exchange or Norton Folgate where the site is simply of importance to the city corporation. Bishopsgate's Good Yard, it's been um, a, a site in, in a degree of dereliction for decades, um, but a wonderful bit of Victorian infrastructure, amazingly robust despite the neglect. Um, there's various evocative undercrofts here, fantastic spaces built to last to the crack of doom. Um, there have been schemes knocking around for this site for quite a while, including um, a scheme put up about 10 years ago now for sort of super, super towers, 50, 60 storey towers on the site. Um, and to some extent that has been influenced, I think, by the, the high towers that do, it, do exist. Um, this is the Broadgate um, Tower um, west of Bishopsgate and also developments that Tower Hamlets have approved on Bethnal Green Road. This is uh, north of Sclatter Street or Club Row. Um, this is looking down Sclatter Street from the corner with Brick Lane. Um, so to some extent, um, a sort of trend has been set by these pretty grim tall buildings. Um, the super tower scheme was due to go to Boris as mayor for his consent. Um, but in the end, uh, that scheme was withdrawn, and so permission was never given for it. And instead, it's been replaced by something that, that claims to be more modest, um, but uh, is still a scheme of gigantic proportions, particularly um, towards its western end. As these images that I'm going to show you now um, of before and after will, I think, show you. So this is just north of um, the Norton Folgate site, looking north up Shoreditch High Street towards, uh, towards Hackney. Um, in the foreground, we've got the bridge of, um, uh, with the railway cutting uh, going into Liverpool Street running underneath. Uh, and this is what will replace what you see. Um, buildings so big because they can't get into the photograph. This is looking um, from the Hackney side of Commercial Street, lovely little flat iron building in the foreground. And here we see the monster behind. This is looking south down Shoreditch High Street, um, the, the, the T building um, on the left hand side, um, fine warehouse, um, itself quite a big building and it goes up to I think nine stories. Um, but it's going to be completely dwarfed by these proposals. Um, this is looking down um, Bethnal Green Road um, from, the, from the east, near the junction with uh, Brick Lane. Um, and here a wall of development. And then looking the other way down Bethnal Green Road um, from Shoreditch High Street. Um, and Again, we see this absolute monsters. Well, uh, the scheme uh, was actually considered by both boroughs and um, Hackney, to their credit, put up um, some pretty stiff opposition. Um, they uh, protested, um, both their officers and their committee said that the scheme was gonna cause um, very serious harm to, to heritage and to the townscape. Um, Tower Hamlets, um, uh, didn't object on those grounds at all. Um, uh, their real objection was um, over the size of the hotel um, and, and not enough housing. Again, I think the officers themselves were pretty happy with the scheme. 
um, but the, the, the members weren't. Um, just in terms of the heritage impact from the Tower Hamlet site, this is Elder Street, um, one of the finest um, early 18th century streets in Spitalfields. And this is what it will have at the end of it if the scheme goes ahead. Well, the scheme went to uh, the GLA um, and following the tradition of his predecessor, the scheme was approved um, by the current mayor. Not that I think he has much interest, particularly in the built environment. So um, a question mark, I guess, over whether that scheme will actually get built, but uh, we can come on to that perhaps towards the end. The fifth scheme takes us down to the south, um, to the uh, to the sort of southwest edge, I think, of Spitalfields, where it abuts Old Gate. Um, this is a, a view down Wentworth Street, um, uh, taken last year. Um, uh, market not in operation uh, because of the COVID crisis. A lot of the um, shops shut, but we can see how the city. The eastern end of the city and its clusters of towers sort of looms over this area already. Um, uh, but having said that, um, Commercial Street um, uh, has got some really fine um, buildings lining it. It's one of the great Victorian um, street improvements in London, lined by magnificent warehouses, and it has recently um, had the setting of, of Toynbee Hall, which you see here, enormously improved with the creation of this new public space, and new buildings either side of it of appropriate scale. And here we can see that five stories, very much in the keeping of the four or five story Victorian warehouses that line the rest of the street. Well, the site that we're going to look at now lies immediately to the south of this. Um, it's outlined in red. So this is the junction here of Commercial Street and Whitechapel High Street. And as I say, this site, this is the buildings on the corner at the moment. Um, four storey, um, late Victorian Edwardian buildings, I think, um, shops with um, commercial use above. And here we see Whitechapel High Street and we see um, the towers of Allgate next to it. Allgate has had a sort of massive um, uh, uh, sort of high rise uh, development over the last 15 years. Um, but um, the, the site in question is outside that designated uh, development cluster of towers. It lies within the Whitechapel conservation area. Nevertheless, uh, an application um, was put in um, to redevelop this site uh, with another tower. Um, and um, this is what was proposed. On the left-hand side, you see uh, an existing tower on the uh, west side, um, and then uh, a, a new tower put up, actually slightly greater height um, over the top and extending down Commercial Street towards Toynbee Hall. Uh, again, an absolute monster. Um, and this is what it was going to look like. Facadism of the corner building um, with this giant stacked up on top of it. Um, there were uh, howls of protest of this from, from everybody. Even Historic England objected to this, um, which uh, saying something. Um, and the scheme was withdrawn. Um, and uh, to our dismay, um, a revised scheme has been put in, which according to the, um, the words um, in the uh, applicant's uh, statement, this is a scheme that has been negotiated um, with Tower Hamlet's officers as a compromise. Um, the suggestion being that it might, in the eyes of the planning officers, be seen as an acceptable compromise. So this um, staggers down, it's less high than the existing tower to the west. Um, uh, and again, you can see here the uh, proposed elevation on Commercial Street. Um, but uh, again, this is the, the, the impact that it will have. So if this is a lessening of the scheme, then um, it's negligible, I would have thought, in terms of its damage to the area. 
Um, this is a view, um, you can just see Toynbee Hall. They've rather cleverly sought to sort of cut it out um, of this image. Um, but this is the impact that the new building will have um, on Commercial Street and Toynbee Hall. Again, uh, this is uh, potentially uh, a huge incursion into Spitalfields of the city office formula, the corporate office. This uh, scheme is has yet to be determined, so um, uh, but I think it's 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 coming up for determination quite soon. Um, and so now we move uh, finally to the Old Truman Brewery. Um, again, perhaps the heart of Spitalfields, um, uh, certainly not on the edge of it. Um, a site uh, that the Old Truman Brewery straddles Brick Lane. This um, uh, shows the site, the or uh, orange yellow buildings of the Truman Brewery complex. Brewing, brewing stopped here in the uh, 19, late 1980s and the whole site um, all its buildings and land was bought up by um, a family firm called um, Zilof. Uh, I think they acquired the site pretty cheaply in the 80s. Um, uh, and um, uh, they've been running the site um, ever since. Um, but they have um, comparatively recently come forward with development proposals um, for part of the site, which fronts onto Woodsia Street and Brick Lane, outlined here in red. Um, again, here's the site shown in blue. Um, and uh, there is great concern about what is being proposed here um, and uh, what the implications will be for, for, the, for this part of Spitalfields if this scheme goes ahead. Um, the site at the moment um, uh, is occupied by, by car parking. I mean, interestingly, it was never really part of the brewing site. It was acquired by the brewery comparatively late on in the 1970s, um, really to extend their, their sort of parking provision. Um, this is looking down Woodsia Street today um, with uh, residential um, on the south side, charming row of 1840s cottages, uh, and then this brick wall uh, on the north side, which hides the, hides the car parking behind it. Um, so just go back. Um, that's what the site, um, that's what used to cover the site before um, they were demolished um, in the 70s and 80s. There was this pub on the corner, um, uh, the Black Eagle, which was sort of a brewery tap, single story building. What is being proposed is something of far, far greater scale. Um, again, if I just use the cursor to, to show here, this building here is the existing bridge building across Brick Lane, which is quite a, quite a large building. Um, so what is being proposed is something almost twice as high as that. These are the buildings, existing buildings on the south corner with Woodsia Street, um, Edwardian buildings, which are three stories. Um, and so there's the parapet line. It's going to be twice as high as that. And on Woodsia Street, uh, we've got a great mass of building here. And what's in this building? Um, there is the bridge across. Um, uh, you can see, so what is being proposed is something almost twice as high as that on the corner fronting on the bridge. And there is a, there is a, 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 a view of the, the massing that's being proposed completely out of scale, we would argue, for Woodsia Street. The ground floor is proposed to be retail. These are quite large units um, uh, and um, fronting onto Woodsia Street, which will be widened um, with a widened pavement as well. Uh, so quite radically changing the character of what at the moment is a residential street. Uh, and then above that is large office floor plates presumably for corporate lets to, who knows, another law firm perhaps, uh, if the track record of um, uh, the, the market buildings and the fruit and wool exchange is anything to go by. Uh, this is a visualization uh, the applicant has produced of um, what their new shopping mall will look like. And again, you can see the upper floors of the 
serried ranks of strip lights behind uh, the glass, uh, big open plan uh, office accommodation and um, bland uh, looking shop fronts, um, uh, presumably, which will appeal to, to um, sort of corporate chains. There is, I say, a planning application in at the moment um, on this, and uh, we, we are uh, sort of urging people to, to add their weight to the uh, objections um, to try and persuade Tower Hamlets to refuse this application. There is also, um, I think, a, a, a considerable concern um, that there is no um, master plan or, or over, overall sort of planning brief for the, the brewery site as a whole. Um, uh, as you can see, this is just showing the, um, uh, the, the east side of the brewery um, uh, with the brick lane running down the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the left edge of this slide. Um, uh, the brewery extends to an equal extent on the other side. And, and what is really desperately needed here is, is, a plan, is a planning brief or a master plan to guide the future development of this site to ensure that um, a mix of uses, a good mix of uses is achieved, that there is um, public realm created through the site and proper public realm, proper public accessibility um, through the site. Uh, when I worked at Islington, I was involved in lots and lots of master planning and planning brief exercises, such as the Cannon Brewery in Clerkenwell, which turned out to be very, very useful tools and ensured that uh, we got a mixture of uses, including housing. Um, previously, Mayor Biggs at Tower Hamlets has said that there should be a planning brief for this site. Um, Historic England have said that, and indeed the, the council's own um, uh, conservation area guidelines, management guidelines um, for the Brick Lane conservation area say that there should be a planning brief, but there's great reluctance amongst the current planning officers to do one. Um, goodness knows why. But at the moment, um, their policies are simply not good enough really to resist anything that the developer might want to do on any site in this area. Um, and um, there's a, a great concern about that, that the developer may just pick off one site at a time for a series of commercial office developments. Um, our concern uh, about this has been uh, illustrated recently by the um, uh, destruction of the uh, granite, wonderful granite, historic granite sets in the yard of the brewery, north of the application site. Um, the rich history here of, of brewing and uh, sort of wonderful puzzle here about what these various slabs and, and their arrangement um, were, were all about, fascinating history. Well, the uh, owner of the site has decided to dig them all up and remove them. Um, and he's gone ahead and done it. So now we just have a mass of concrete. Um, so is this owner really to be trusted? Um, possibly not. Um, so uh, our campaign at the Trust is really to, to say that Brick Lane deserves better. Um, Spitalfields deserves better. Um, its small businesses, its local community um, deserves better. Um, uh, and, and what is really needed here is something that is far more sensitive to the needs and affordability of the local community, both in terms of workspaces and living accommodation. And um, I think I'll stop there on that note um, and um, hand over to uh, John um, to take over the reins again and perhaps discuss some of the issues. Alex, uh, thank you very much. I have to say there wasn't much uh, comedy in that. It was really incredibly depressing. Um, I remember first visiting Spitalfields more than 30 years ago. I'd arrived back down from, from Glasgow and a friend of mine said, there's this fascinating area. It's called Brick Lane and you can wander down. You've got to go at four o'clock in the morning and you get all these incredible bargains, really interesting things. And we arrived just as the 
as the sun was coming up and the cast of characters that you describe, I remember them all. I remember in particular one man who, at first you thought he was a flasher. He, he, he wore this coat like this and he would open it. And inside he would have watches pinned in all the lining, antique watches. And you could pick one of the watches and, and pay a few quid for it. And then he would, then he would, then he would close it again. And we broke into one of those houses in Sclater Street. Um, and an old lady had obviously lived there. And I discovered subsequently that had been the animal market because there were all little brown bottles of all the potions that she'd taken half a century before when she'd lived there. And cages, empty cages of birds everywhere with their feathers still there. And I discovered subsequently that in the late 19th century, early 20th century, you could have got any kind of animal or bird there, couldn't you? you could, don't know whether it's apocryphal or not, but apparently you could buy a tiger there at, 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 at one point. Who knows if that was true? Given that Spitalfields, um, I wouldn't be at all surprised. When I got my house in Spitalfields, the block between the Ten Bells pub, where Jack the Ripper picked up some of his victims, and the corner, which um, Kira Knightley went on to buy to show you how much the area changed. That whole block was completely derelict. And when I got my house, it had no electricity, no water in it, no gas. It had never been plumbed in its whole history. The bank manager in the Bank of Scotland, when I tried to get a mortgage said, Mr. Nicholson, I think that is a most unwise investment. Um, and I couldn't get a mortgage. For it. But when I started unpeeling the house, and the gentle author covered this in an article, I found wallpaper dating from 1690 to 1960. Um, the house was built in 1721, so the wallpaper was 30 years older than the house, which suggests that it must have been a treasured collection of wallpaper that somebody or somebody's family had kept until they built the house and then they put it up. So it's, it's truly a magical area. Um, I think you're right to highlight what Boris Johnson did. I went and spoke against, on behalf of the neighborhood and residents against the fruit and wool exchange plans. I saw Boris Johnson arrive for his inspection. He must've been in the building 10 minutes. He never went to the basement where all the fruit uh, traders, all the, the market traders had hidden during the Second World War with all the graffiti from the 1930s. He never saw that huge trading room. He went straight up onto the roof. He talked to the developers and he came back down and then he went off to rubber stamp what he'd always planned to do, what he always did, which is to side with big corporations against residents. Let me ask you a question. All the people who are listening here, Naomi said, posted, uh, who will go to all these shops? Colin has been posting. He said, would it help if we gave councillors proper briefings? And David summed it up for everybody saying this is all so depressing. What are the lessons? What can people do to stop this happening, to learn the lessons from what has happened? Well, I think the, the, the first thing to do is to get Town Hamlet's council to refuse the Woodsia Street application, that's, that's imperative. And it, that site is, is too small to be called in by the GLA. Um, so so that, would, that is definitely the first step. And I, I think there does need to be a planning brief done for the whole of the brewery site to ensure that affordable housing is achieved on the site, to ensure that there is affordable business space, workshop space for, for local people. Um, it needs a radical rethink. Um, the Woodsia Street scheme, I didn't mention, but it includes a two-storey double-height basement. I mean, an incredible amount of work to do that um, and a huge cost of doing that, which can inevitably only be brought back, got back by charging very high rents. So what is really needed, and I think the same goes for the Bishopsgate Goods Yard site, is something that's far less ambitious that that sort of keeps existing fabric. Perhaps we, we look even at just putting up prefab buildings at the moment. 
Um, because sort of post COVID, we're, we're almost in a sort of post war situation um, where we need to put things up uh, that are needed now, uh, that are needed by local people and that local people can afford. And that means building things very cheaply, perhaps on a semi temporary basis, something that may only last perhaps for 20 years, but we'll do a job now. Um, and certainly at the goods yard, it's scandalous to be to be demolishing millions and millions and millions of bricks and carting all that embodied energy away to landfill or wherever. Um, that really does need a huge rethink. The amount of retail being proposed, of course, is crazy. And I mean, we've already seen pre-COVID that the new retail units in the fruit and wool exchange have not let. Not one of them has let. They're all sitting there empty shop till you drop um, uh, you, you know you know i i remember the promises that were made i remember the time of the uh, first of all of the um spitalfields market and the local community especially um the bengali community were promised that if this development went ahead there'd be lots of jobs for bengalis there and that there would be lots of little local shops those were the firm promises made you'll go around uh, Spitalfields Market, you won't see a Bengali face in any of the businesses. And the idea that there are little, small, independent retailers is nonsense. What they do is they try and bring in the big corporate brands, and then they stay for a while and then they leave. Because people will cross London to go to, um, St. Uh, to, you know, to, go to um, St. John's, won't they? But they're not going to go to across London to go to Pret-a-Manger, because they're everywhere. Or a, or a Starbucks, because they're everywhere. Yeah. I mean, the only future, surely, of places like that is to be distinctive, different, and interesting as destinations. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it, it's interesting to see how the city corporation behaves as a landlord. Uh, they are absolutely hopeless, really. They All they can think of is the, is the corporate um, high street chain. And if you look at their, their own development in Cheapside, um, uh, that is just full of sort of normal chain shops. And you're absolutely right, people don't bother to travel there. Uh, it, it, it's not a destination. Um, I mean, it's, I, think, I think it's a real shame in, in many ways that Spitalfields Market moved um, because uh, th that had a roughness and a, a vibrancy to it, um, as does still Smithfield Market, of course. Um, the fact that we in Islington managed to, to keep Smithfield Market operating as a meat market in the 1980s actually ensured that Clerkenwell didn't become uh, part of the city. Um, it retained a sort of rough edge um, and it, it attracted a different sort of, of, of developer with smaller units, a mixture of residential uh, and, and, and studio uh, type office accommodation, not the huge corporate um, uh, ground. Why, why, why are the planning officers so hopeless, so consistently hopeless? They don't seem to care about the historic environment and they don't seem to care either about providing housing in areas which so desperately need housing. What, what has gone so wrong with the, with the planning officers where they are I mean, why don't they go off and work for these big corporations if that's their bag? Why do they pretend to be interested in conservation? Uh, well, there's been a huge cut in local government planning departments. Indeed, probably some of their colleagues have gone off and worked for the, for, for, for the in the private sector. Um, I think there's a great temptation now in planning departments just for an easy life. Um, it's easier to approve something than to refuse something with the prospect perhaps of a planning appeal and all the work that that might entail. Um, so uh, you, you do see this in, in other boroughs where there's a tendency now just to sort of tick the box and yeah, so well, it's okay. Um, what is needed is some real direction, I think, from the members to, to direct their offices. The councillors. The councillors. I mean, at the end of the day, the offices are being employed by, by the councillors. The councillors should be the bosses here. And they need to take over the reins of control here uh, and um, you know, get their officers to do what they want them to do. Um, that may need 
at refining or improving some of their policies. Um, and particularly, I think, doing master plans and planning briefs for, for, for potentially important sites like the Truman Brewery. Um, that's what um, we've, we've come to the end of our hour. Um, I'm just seeing lots and lots of questions um, uh, coming up. And honestly, I think we could keep this going for, for a couple of hours, but uh, one hour is our allotted time. I, I think we're all very keen to try and save Woodseer Street from these ghastly proposals, apart from anything else you should say, because nobody's going to move into these uh, shops. I mean, anybody who spends time in Brick Lane knows the kind of customer base that Brick Lane has, and it's not for awful corporate uh, shops. We've seen that from the fruit and, from the fruit and wool. If people want to help, uh, we're going to just put up on screen in a few moments how they can write and how they can appeal and just focus attention on this. They can follow the Spitalfields Trust on Twitter and elsewhere. Uh, they can follow, the, of course, the Gentle Author on Twitter uh, and elsewhere. And we're very, very keen on we. This is the final thought, Alex, to get people power in action here and to focus and focus councillors' minds on the Woodseer development, not least because the Mayor of London can't call this in, as you point out. So it's, it doesn't have to go the same way as some of the other developments um, that you've spoken about. Alex, it's been a, a real um, a pleasure listening to you uh, talking about uh, these, um, these uh, developments. Not a happy story, uh, but there's no inevitability in history, is there? And, uh, and we can perhaps do better in the, in the future. And let's bring, bring people back into the city centre with low cost affordable housing. So it's not the preserve of big corporations. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alex Forshaw. And uh, you've been um, watching a presentation from the Spitalfields Trust. Thank you all so much for listening. Good night.